So thank you very much for inviting me to the International Research Conference to talk about a very cool topic as a patient reported outcomes. Here are my conflict of interest. So patient reported outcomes are any report of the stages of a patient health condition that comes directly from the patient without interpretation of the patient response by a clinician or anyone else. And such um, patient reporting outcomes are most often collected using patient reporting outcome measures that are self-completed questionnaires commonly collecting data on general quality of life or, or and related quality of life, as well as physical, emotional, social function, but also signal or symptoms from the patient own point of view. Uh, the prompts uh, are used to capture the patient view about their health status and facilitate in this way the understanding of the impact of the disease and the treatment on patients' uh, quality of life uh, and the symptoms. Um, patient reporting outcome measures data if collected, analyzed and reported appropriately uh, can inform the shared decision making and or to pharmaceutical uh, labeling claims and the health policy. Can also improve the patient and physician communication and tailoring the patient therapy to improve the outcome. So, problems are a really important role as primary and secondary endpoints in clinical trials and other epidemiological studies. The mode of administration of PROMS has traditionally been in paper format, but increasingly they are being completed electronically by using different uh, platforms. Um, here I show you a very important paper in the use of uh, PROMS uh, in a clinical trial because the, this is a spirit pro extension uh, trial that was developed as a systematic review of the existing uh, pro-specific protocol guidance uh, um, available until uh, 2014. Uh, and it provided uh, with this publication in 2018, an international consensus-based guidance uh, on the use of pro-specific information that should be included in uh, clinical trial protocols. Um, pros are also becoming more and more important also in clinical research as um, demonstrated by uh, this, this picture, because we have a greatly increased interest in pros as revealed by the high number of publication on this topic in the last year, more than 15,000 in 2020. Most of evidence of the usefulness of pros in clinical studies came from oncology. Um, because uh, um, in, in oncology, there are a lot of studies that offer, uh, in which PROMS can offer a standardized approach on the measuring the quality of life. And as an example, this is a very recent paper published in a journal of patient reporting outcomes um, that uh, uh, reported the ongoing clinical trial on breast cancer drugs uh, available at April 2021 that use PROS as important uh, approval endpoints. So in the last 20 years, uh, among the FDA approved drugs, 13 were indicated for breast cancer treatment and 11 out of 13 included pro measure uh, and um, point information in the FDA medical review document. In rare diseases, uh, PROMS uh, should be really important because the impact of rare disease can be different uh, and uh, may present challenges uh, for patients uh, in their uh, social interaction, in their works, in their education, and can also have an impact uh, in the quality of life of uh, um, other, other family members. But however, uh, we have um, a list of issues in the use of PROMS uh, in uh, rare diseases, mainly due to the dearth of validated PROMS, and uh, uh, to the issue related to the data collection and statistical analysis uh, in rare diseases, because uh, we have uh, usually small sample sizes, heterogeneous study population, and uh, uh, multi-center international studies that cause a different context of uh, the recruitment in a clinical trial. 
The PROMS that we can use in rare disease are generic PROMS, for example, a short form 36 item free survey that more than 10 years ago was still the most used PROMS in rare diseases, or the Euro quality of life five dimension or health utility index. Um, in, a, in the same way, we can have also um, specific PROMS, uh, um, uh, PROMS are specific to certain disease. In phenylketonuria, we have in Fabry disease, Botushol retinopathy. But uh, um, despite this example, most rare diseases lack specific PROMS that can be used to gain um, a better understanding of the issue uh, that uh, uh, the, rare, the patients with rare disease uh, experience. The position paper uh, by Eurordis uh, emphasized a few years ago the need of the assessment uh, from the patient perspective and the patient quality of life uh, was also listed as a major priority of rare disease research in the framework uh, um, for 2014-2020. And Eurordis also launched the call for the developing and validating validation of uh, patient reporting outcome tools. In the same way, in um, 2015, the US Congress implemented with the FDA a program for the patient focused drug uh, development. And on the same route, um, it's important to show this paper that is really, really a milestone in, uh, in the use of PROMS uh, in a clinical trial for rare disease. Because this paper, um, address the challenges uh, uh, in the identification, selection, the, um, development, implementation of patient reporting outcomes and observed reporting outcome assessment in rare disease clinical trial. And uh, it was like a starting point for the development of uh, um, the inventory of pragmatic uh, as well as creative solution that uh, could lead to the increase of uh, number of uh, uh, clinical uh, trials in rare disease uh, using PROMS uh, as uh, um, primary or secondary, in most of cases, secondary outcomes. Uh, another very recent paper, um, I think it's interesting because it uh, gives a potential solution catched from the literature for the use of PROMS in rare diseases. Um, some suggestions are mainly linked to the development of um, a core outcome measure set across the disease or disease subtypes so with the use of disease group uh, PROMS where you know, when no specific uh, PROMS does exist or a combined population with a similar disease characteristic to increase the sample size. Other suggestion is the collaboration of proactive stakeholders to discuss uh, about the feasibility of PROMS data and the use of computer-assisted uh, technology um, in, to streamline the PROMS uh, development uh, process. In alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, uh, PROMS, the use of PROMS is quite widely accepted, and I will show you uh, some uh, example of how PROMS uh, have been used uh, in uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, first of all, the, um, the integrated health management program of Prolastin Direct and uh, uh, in general the education and supported the services provided by AlphaNet have been shown to lead an improvement of patient reporting outcomes. In particular, this, this project, uh, the EDMAP, uh, EDMAP Alpha-1 Antitrypsin Deficient Disease Management and Prevention Program, uh, used uh, um, some problems uh, as a perceived way perceived fitness, perceived health, in uh, um, evaluated uh, whether uh, the adherence to uh, EDMAP or, or not uh, can um, imply in uh, the uh, disease knowledge and the health status in alpha-1 antitrypsin patients. And another patient, uh, just for example, my campus and co-workers uh, use the St. George Related uh, Respiratory Questionnaire and the SF36 uh, uh, as a measure uh, uh, for health quality uh, of life related. Another example is this uh, um, interesting paper by Alistair and co-worker um, that demonstrated how CT densitometry 
correlates with uh, quality of life, so, um, St. George respiratory questionnaire scores. And more recently, uh, this uh, paper uh, by Joanna Kostowska uh, and uh, other co worker and, and friends really pointed out uh, the new patient centric approaches that we should use in the management of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. And in this view, it is very clear the completely lack of PROMS in a randomized clinical trial uh, about augmentation therapy in alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. On the other side, uh, this paper underlined the utility of PROMS in a registry, which can recruit more uh, larger number of, no of patients and also to follow them for many years. And so in this way can contribute with, with valuable information. From uh, another perspective, uh, the recently um, cited paper by Mark Miravitles about the research priority of uh, the ARCO group uh, listed among uh, the research priority at number seven, the development of a specific patient reported outcome for patients with emphysema associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So as a natural consequence of all this data in the ARCO registry, uh, we collected uh, uh, data on quality of life with uh, uh, problems like CAT, AQ5D, and St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. And of course, we are looking forward to analyzing this data in the next uh, years. But um, talking about pros and without patient view would not have been uh, uh, exhaustive and, and complete. So I thank you very much, Karen, that uh, uh, would join uh, this, uh, this discussion. And uh, I invite Karen uh, to take part uh, to the presentation. So Karen, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to thank the organizers, obviously, for inviting me to share with you the patient community's view on patient reported outcomes but as i've had some problems i'm actually going to turn my video off because uh, it's played up this afternoon um so obviously uh alari has introduced the concept of pros and she shared the fda definition of what a pro is but what i'd like to highlight is that contrary to the common perception a pro can be much more extensive than just capturing a patient's health related quality of life and it may also include additional measures of the patient's health status. So as the definition at the bottom of my slide shows, um, the patient reported outcome measure is an instrument that may also capture concepts such as functionality or activity levels. So the importance and use of PROs for drug approval and reimbursement has increased considerably over the last two decades. There are a number of reasons for that. The clinical outcome measures such as CT densitometry are useful surrogates, but they don't capture the full impact of a condition or treatment on patients. The FDA and DMA recognize PROs as a measure of treatment efficacy. And as I'm speaking, not only as a representative of the UK, but also the European patient community, I'd like to draw your attention to the specific challenges that patients face in accessing disease specific therapies in Europe compared to my fellow patients in the US. Health, techno health technology appraisal bodies and payers outside the US have higher and more stringent requirements for novel therapies to demonstrate clinically meaningful improvements and patient relevant benefits. Benefit assessment that is heavily reliant on surrogate outcome measures is nowadays highly unlikely to result in a positive reimbursement decision. Disease specific PROs have become prerequisites to facilitate broad and sustained patient access to novel therapies in ex US markets. So the mandate of regulatory authorities is to evaluate the risk benefit ratio of a treatment. If that is positive and the benefits are seen to outweigh the risks, the treatment receives a license. However, whether or not payers are willing to reimburse a treatment depends entirely on whether or not they perceive the treatment to deliver added value. The issue with value 
is that it is in the eye of the beholder. And doctors, payers and patients, or society at large, may have very different perspectives of what constitutes value. Even payers in Europe may have a different perspective on the value of a new treatment than payers in the US. And the same is true for patients, because their perception of the added value of a new treatment depends on what their current standard of care looks like. And the standard of care may be different in different parts of the world. In the last decade, payers have therefore focused their assessment of new treatments much more on patient relevant outcomes, such as PROs. So why do we need a PRO for AATD? Unfortunately, there's been little progress in advancing clinical outcomes assessment of disease specific therapeutic approaches since prolastin was first approved 34 years ago. The problem we have with existing AATD therapies is that none of the pivotal trials conducted to date have shown convincing efficacy as per the payer requirements in many countries. Neither have any of the existing treatments been able to demonstrate a statistically significant improvement in any patient reported measure. And this includes the quality of life instruments such as the St. George's questionnaire or the generic EQ5D. In addition, little real world evidence exists that has been shown to be robust enough to convince payers that augmentation therapy alleviates the burden of disease for patients in the long term and should therefore be broadly available. Consequently, augmentation therapy has not met the reimbursement hurdles in many of the ex-US countries resulting in a significant geographic inequality of access to replacement therapy. And patients in many countries do not currently have access to any specific therapy. This is why we urgently need to improve the evidence base in Alpha One by developing outcome measures, including PROs that are fit for purpose to get patients access to them. There are a number of encouraging novel therapies in development that employ new modes of action. For the first time, there are also treatments in development that target the liver. So it is crucial that we have fit for purpose PRO instruments developed and validated in time for them to be used in registration trials. We also need to improve the evidence base for the burden of disease in order to demonstrate the high unmet need for effective treatments that exists in Alpha One. Development of PROs and other instruments to assess health related quality of life that are specific for Alpha One, that are validated and widely accepted by regulators, HTA bodies and payers are therefore critical in order to pave the way for broad patient access to these exciting new therapies under development. The patient community fully understands that it is no mean feat to generate this kind of evidence and to develop new outcome measures. However, there are examples of multi-stakeholder initiatives showcasing that this can be achieved in a rare disease, but it requires a truly collaborative effort. Duchenne patients experience difficulties with getting access to the first licensed treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy because Although there was no doubt that the treatment was effective, the existing evidence did not fully convince payers. In response, in 2017, Duchenne UK launched Project Hercules, which stands for Health Research Collaboration United in Leading Evidence Synthesis. Hercules is a consortium of patient organisations, clinicians, academics, pharma and biotech companies, regulators, HTA agencies and other advisors. The objective of the project is to generate a better evidence base for Duchenne's to increase the chances of new treatments being approved and made available to patients. The project has been an extremely fruitful collaboration of all stakeholders and has already yielded extremely val valuable tools, including the burden of illness study, a new disease specific quality of life measure, 
and a core economic model that accurately reflects the natural history of the disease. Several other key projects expect to deliver outputs in the near future. Project Hercules demonstrates what can be achieved if all stakers join forces and pursue a common goal. The Alpha One community in Europe therefore calls for a systematic concerted effort by all stakeholders to improve the evidence base in AATD and to develop one or more fit for purpose, disease specific patient reported outcome instrument to meet the requirements for authorization and reimbursement of novel AATD therapies. To be successful, such an initiative requires a multi-stakeholder steering committee that provides oversight. However, the strategic leadership and tactical ex execution of PRA development needs to be handed over to leading health economics outcomes research experts who will need to work in very close collaboration with clinicians and patients. Regulators and HTA agencies should be involved in the initiative in an advisory capacity to ensure that the tools will meet their requirements. Developing PROs or generating evidence will of course be costly. However, all pharmaceutical and biotech companies that currently manufacture or are developing therapies for the treatment of AATD will join forces to provide funding to support this critical initiative. We as the patient community are absolutely committed to support this and we are prepared to put our money where our mouth is. As such, national patient groups in Europe have to date raised and ring-fenced a six-figure sum, which we'd, we would like to contribute towards the development of one or more Alpha One specific PRO by a multi-stakeholder collaboration as proposed on this slide. The patient community in Europe strongly feels that enough decades have passed in which a lot of valuable research has been conducted in Alpha One but without significantly improving access to patients to existing therapies. The continued lack of fit for purpose outcome measures, including disease specific PROs are a key reason for that. We have no more time to lose to finally close this gap. We believe that everyone with an interest in AATD needs to play their part to make this happen. It is not only patients who have skin in this game, but it is only the patients who continue to die before their time, sorry, if their access to effective treatments does not improve. We therefore call on all of you to join together in such an initiative. Alaria quoted a paper on PROs in rare diseases, which was actually co-authored by one of our advocates, who happens to be a professional in clinical outcomes research and market access. So we, the patient community, are not only able to contribute money to such an initiative, but also expertise. National patient, European Alpha One patient groups will soon publish a consensus statement committing to supporting the development of a specific PRO. But as Helen Keller says, we cannot do this alone. We don't have the bandwidth and we don't have the resources to do this on our own. So we are urging you clinicians and industry to join forces with us to establish a consortium that can make a PRO in AATD a reality. We would love to hear your feedback and ideas on how we can get the ball rolling and you can contact us on our email address at info at alphaone.org.uk. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Farodi and uh, Karen for your presentations. We'll now take the next uh, few minutes to go through some questions. Uh, please go ahead and put them in the chat and I will ask them to our presenters. So the first question that I have is, are patient reported outcomes data required for all studies and trials? I, I think they're essential because in Europe, what we're finding is getting access to therapies and treatments is reliant now upon patient reported outcome measures and in alpha one we just don't we don't have that evidence and the data to support access uh, 
Okay, Dr. Ferrodi, do you want to add into any to that? Yes, Karen, perfectly centered uh, the question. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the situation uh, of, of Europe uh, is also uh, different, uh, difficult for the fact that we have uh, also different country together. So it's not easy to find a solution that is fine everywhere. But of course, uh, we, as, uh, as Karen showed with uh, the example of the Duchenne, we have uh, some example uh, in front of us in uh, a rare disease uh, that uh, can be followed. And uh, as well, uh, the, um, the possibility to join this very large group of study, ARCO is an example uh, limited to alpha-1 antitrips inefficiency, but the possibility to be uh, included uh, in uh, the Erlang, for example, and to share experience uh, with uh, other patients and other situations with uh, not the same uh, disease, but different, can really help uh, in improving uh, quickly the situation. Because as Karen said, the, the time is important and uh, we cannot uh, spend uh, years and find a solution. Okay. So how important are patient reported outcomes um, to clinical research? And are they useful? S sorry, I didn't understand because- So I... are, are patient reported outcomes useful to clinical research? Uh, yeah, uh, in, uh, we, we can also focus on alpha-1 antitrips deficiency, and the, the patient reporting outcomes on quality of life uh, are used in most of registry to compare uh, group uh, and uh, also um, some uh, um, topics of, of the research, so they are widely used. Uh, the problem is the fact that they are not used at all in the clinical trial and also I can add in uh, health technology assessment because also the HTA that is a, is a, a novel award in which uh, we can uh, really understand uh, how a topics, uh, how a tools, a diagnostic tool uh, as well can be useful. Uh, here is another uh, another uh, uh, situation where uh, the pro-reported outcomes measure can be used uh, in, a, in a very useful uh, way, together with uh, other uh, other tools as well. Great, thank you so much. And I have um, I actually have a question that's probably going to lead to the question that just came in on the chat. Um, is it better to have digital PROs than written ones? If you want to grab that question, Dr. Ferrodi. Well, I, I can actually jump in because- Okay, we showed, perfect, Janine. <laughs> yeah, we just, we showed that in our registry once we went digital, look at the, look at the, look at the change in participation. It's a modern world and digital is probably the best way to go. Um, 